You know, this house could sell for a lot right now. If you don't sell it, you're going to lose out. Let's sell the house and split the money in half. I couldn't help but blurt out, what? At Sophia's excited proposal. I noticed Sophia's face cloud over, but I stood my ground. This house is mine, and I have no intention of selling it. I declared. That's when Sophia started relentlessly harassing me. My name is Michelle. I had no particular desire to get married and was happily living with my mom at our family home. I used to live alone, but moved back after my dad passed away and left my mom all by herself. I was worried about leaving my elderly mom alone, but more than anything, it was heartbreaking to see her so lonely without dad. My mom never pressured me to get married. Whenever you find someone you love, that's good enough for me. She's always saying. I love my job and plan to dedicate my life to it, so marriage was low on my list of priorities. It was a big relief that mom was so understanding about my life choices. I have a brother named Cody. He's married to Sophia, which may be why mom never pressured me to marry. Then one day... Mom went out for groceries and never came back. She left with a smile, only to collapse at the supermarket. By the time I rushed to the hospital after getting the call, Mom was barely hanging on with no signs of consciousness. Please be with her, the doctor could only say. Fighting back panic, I called Cody and Sophia to let them know Mom was critically ill. But Cody said he couldn't leave work and Sophia, who was just at her house nearby, said if Cody wasn't going, she wouldn't either. With mom in critical condition and no one else by her side, I couldn't hold back the tears. Mom had always been kind to both Cody and Sophia. I watched this happen from the sidelines day in and day out. As much as they irritated me, the pain of losing mom overshadowed everything else. Mom... I am right here with you. I gently held mom's unresponsive hand. To my surprise, she lightly gripped mine back. Could she still be alive? This flicker of hope was short-lived. Mom passed away. At the funeral, Cody took the role of the chief mourner. Though he cried having missed her passing, I couldn't forgive him for prioritizing work over mom when she was critically ill and my resentment for Sophia, Cody's wife, intensified. She skipped the funeral, saying she had to work. Sophia's job was just part-time at a checkout counter. She could have easily taken a leave for her mother-in-law's funeral, but she chose not to, which infuriated me. However, I knew mom wouldn't have wanted her death to cause friction between me, Cody, and Sophia. Biting back my anger, I attended the ceremony. As for their inheritance, with no will left, I decided to keep the house where I lived with mom. All of mom's hard-earned money went to Cody and Sophia, but I didn't mind. Mom's savings were more like her hobby, and I was content just preserving this house filled with memories. That was, until even the house came under threat. A year after mom's passing, Cody and Sophia unexpectedly showed up. We barely kept in touch, mostly around memorial services. When I asked why the sudden visit, they requested to move in. Turns out, Sophia invested mom's inheritance in Forex and managed to accumulate a debt of $50,000. Oh, we can't afford rent while repaying the debt, Cody pleaded. I know it's a lot to ask, but can we live here? Otherwise, Sophia and I might end up homeless. Compared to Cody who would practically beg me as if his life depended on it? Sophia, the root cause of our debt, simply said, Pray, please? Her expression was as if it was someone else's problem. I didn't like her attitude but couldn't abandon my own brother Cody. So I agreed. Initially, the cohabitation went smoothly. While Cody and I were at work, Sophia took care of household chores, saving us the time and effort, and for that, I was grateful. Sophia was also a good cook, which made meals something to look forward to. But Sophia continued her reckless spending habits before I knew it. She had brought home designer bags and started using the pricey lotions and moisturizers that even I had deemed too expensive. 
Every time Sophia spent a large sum of money, Cody would blow up, leading to a huge argument between them. And let me tell you, it was super awkward for me to be in the middle of all that. I couldn't help but wonder why Cody wouldn't divorce Sophia given these repetitive issues. Maybe there's something about marital bonds that I wouldn't understand since I'm not married. So I didn't say anything to Cody. Half grateful to Sophia and half exasperated, life went on until one day, the property value of our home skyrocketed. I started getting calls from all corners asking me to sell the house due to impending development. My answer? A hard no. I had no intention of parting with this house which is filled with memories of my parents until the day I died. But Sophia's attitude took a 180. You know, we can get a good price for this house right now. Right? We would be fools not to sell. We should split the money 50-50. I couldn't help but blurt out, what? When I heard her say this, I was angry that Sophia had the audacity to refer to my precious home as this house and suggest selling it so casually. Then, splitting the money like it's no big deal, my feelings were half anger and half disbelief. This house is in my name. I have no intention of giving it away to anyone including you, Sophia. But we need the money, Michelle, you know that, right? The near tearful expression on Sophia's face only added to my disbelief. The only reason we need money is that you have suffered huge losses in forex trading. When mom passed away, she left a considerable inheritance for both you and Cody. I have zero intention of sharing any proceeds from selling this house with you. Upon hearing this, Sophia's face visibly changed color. Flushing red with a distorted expression, Sophia replied, Fine, I get it. And with that, she walked away. I thought it was going to be awkward living with Sophia, but that concern turned out to be unnecessary. After that conversation, Sophia's nasty acts of harassment began. The first instance involved hamburger steak. Sophia, who is good at cooking, had made her specialty hamburger steak. A dish I also enjoyed. But the moment I took a bite, I felt something crunchy and immediately spit the food out onto a napkin. To my surprise, the hamburger steak was filled with eggshells when I looked at Sophia in disbelief. Is something wrong? She just smiled and asked. As I cut into the remaining hamburger steak with a knife, sure enough, there were eggshells in it. Sophia, I hate to bring this up after you have gone through the trouble of cooking, but it looks like there are a lot of eggshells in this. What? Oh no, I'm so sorry. That wasn't intentional. We are out of ingredients and other things to eat too. I couldn't help but think she did it on purpose. You did this on purpose, didn't you? Sophia said, I really didn't do it on purpose. It's terrible that you don't believe me. And began to cry softly. Just as this was happening, Cody came home, interrupting my attempt to explain. Sophia, still in tears, spun the story in her favor. Cody took Sophia's side, saying it wasn't intentional, and told me, Stop harassing my wife like that. After that, Sophia stated that she didn't want to cook for me anymore and only cooked for herself and Cody. She also said she didn't want to do household chores for someone like me. She only cleaned the common areas like the living room and the kitchen but stopped cleaning my room. I didn't care much about the chores, it was just like when I was living alone. I had only been spoiled by Sophia's help till now, however, I noticed something. The money I kept in my room was gradually disappearing. Convinced Sophia was the culprit, I confronted her. She then turned on the waterworks and said, Michelle is treating me like a criminal even though I didn't do anything. And she looked to Cody for support. Cody, in his own way, wasn't helping either. If you keep harassing my wife, you're going to have to leave. That's what he would say to me. It seemed like Sophia had told Cody a bunch of lies, making him believe I was the one harassing her. Get out? This is my house, I said to Cody. The freeloaders here are you and Sophia. You're the ones who should leave. What are you misunderstanding? This led to a big fight between Cody and me. That night, lying in bed, I actually considered leaving. 
Wouldn't it be easier to leave rather than continue dealing with this daily torment? That's when I remembered mom, who, despite her aching back, would carefully mop the hallways. The house was built by Walter, who worked so hard, we have to take good care of it, she used to say while making the house shine with her cleaning. As the image of my own mother flashed in my mind, I held back tears and thought to myself, I shouldn't be the one to leave, it should be Cody and Sophia. I acted quickly once I decided to kick them out. I went to an electronic store and bought several high-quality small security cameras. While Cody was at work and Sophia was out, I installed the cameras all around the house. I set them up to prove that Sophia was stealing my money and that I wasn't harassing her as a daughter-in-law. After a few days of recording, I reviewed the footage in my room. Sure enough, I had caught Sophia entering my room and taking money. But I had captured even more shocking things. That evening, I gathered Cody and Sophia in the living room. Sophia, being a drama queen, pretended to be scared of me. Cody, believing Sophia's side of the story, was giving me a cold stare. Ignoring their attitudes, I began to speak. Actually, I had security cameras installed in the house. My money has been disappearing and I suspected Sophia was behind it, so I wanted proof. Here's the footage. I then played the video on my laptop showing Sophia entering my room and taking the money. The moment Sophia heard the word camera, her face turned pale. Cody, shocked by Sophia's behavior on the laptop, was speechless. The footage clearly showed Sophia as the one taking the money, but I wasn't done. I fast-forwarded the video, and there it was. Footage of Sophia entering the house arm-in-arm arm with an unknown man. Wait, who is this guy? Cody exclaimed while Sophia burst into tears. It was unmistakable that Sophia was cheating. No, 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 this isn't what it looks like. Michelle, did you fabricate this video? I have heard that video technology has advanced a lot recently. I am not a video editor and I can create such high-quality fake videos, I responded. Engrossed in the footage of Sophia and the unknown man, Cody was aghast. Sophia, on the other hand, Stop the video now! Sophia screamed at me. Amidst this hellish atmosphere, I spoke clearly. Please, deal with the infidelity between yourselves. As for living here, I would like you to move out. I can't live with someone who takes money without permission and uses it for cheating. With a straight face, I paused the video. I hand Cody the SD card with the recorded data. Be out in a month and kick Sophia out immediately. I tell him. Cody, now back to his senses, starts yelling at Sophia. Later, their loud arguments fills the house. Take your fight somewhere else, I say. Cody moves the scene to a diner. Busy calling in the man Sophia cheated with and her parents, Cody sets the stage for a divorce. I hear Sophia will be solely responsible for repaying the debts and she even gets a payout from the divorce settlement. Sophia is of course taken back by her parents that night. Her parents had seen the video where I was robbed of my money and they handed me some cash. I don't know if this is enough, but… They say. I accept it as a sort of restitution. Cody had the audacity to ask to stay in the house a little longer after the divorce. I refuse. There is no way I could forgive Cody who was about to kick me out trusting Sophia's words. This is the home dad built and mom lovingly maintained. I can't allow someone who allowed his wife to cheat and wanted to kick me out, the heir, to stay here. I gave you a month out of the last shred of sibling decency. Leave as soon as possible. I say, I didn't want Cody, who never valued this house and never believed me to stay a second longer. Rejected by me, Cody leaves and I have no idea what his life is like now. Cody and Sophia divorce and her parents cover the divorce settlement in a lump sum. Cody manages to get the compensation from the man Sophia cheated with and rents a house far away. I hear that much. As for me, my days return to a peaceful calm without Cody and Sophia.
The comfort of having the house to myself is unmatched. In the serene, quiet filling the home, I gazed at a memorial photo. Facing my parents' picture, I wonder if this was the right thing to do, I murmur. The parents in the photo only offer me their smiles, it's lonely. But I feel they would approve of what I have done. I still get calls asking if I want to sell this house but I have no intention of giving it to anyone until the day I die. Until my last breath, I vow to protect this home. I'm the eldest son. You knew living with my mother would be a possibility when we got married, didn't you? You never mentioned that when we first got married. My husband, having moved in with my mother-in-law earlier than his sister, sold his family home. He has left the sole responsibility of taking care of my mother-in-law to me, a stay-at-home wife. He must have planned this for a long time. My name is Laura. I'm a 46-year-old housewife. My husband, Robert, is 44 years old. He works for a decent company, but he's a subsection manager who boasts about his Ivy League education. We have two sons. We are a family of four, but following our eldest, our youngest son also graduated from college this summer and moved out. At such a moment, my husband suddenly started to act on his own. We're going to take in my mom soon, he declared. I'm hearing this for the first time. I was shocked, as this was news to me. My mother-in-law lost her husband, my father-in-law, last year. Considering they were a couple who always did everything together, I had been worried about how shocked my mother-in-law must have been, but living together suddenly, anyone would be surprised. You have plenty of time, he implied, since I am, after all, a stay-at-home wife. He instructed me to visit my mother-in-law every day and talk to her. I argued that if I went every day, it might exhaust my mother-in-law, but my husband's aim was to make me and my mother-in-law get along through frequent visits. For him, bringing up living together wasn't easy, even to his own mother, so he used me, thinking that if us two women got along well, it would be easier for him to implement his plan. The house where my mother-in-law lives now is a stylish, standalone house built by my late father-in-law in a popular area, not in downtown, but somewhere akin to a suburb in Chicago. If put up for sale, there would definitely be many buyers willing to buy it for a great price. Right. My husband got his eyes on this house. I sense that by living with my mother-in-law, he wants to gain the right to do whatever he pleases with his parents' house. A few days later, my husband came home looking irritated. Apparently, his sister contacted him. You have been visiting my mom, haven't you? He said while roughly throwing his coat at me. Yes, about once every three or four days, I replied, hanging his carelessly thrown coat on a hanger. My sister went to visit mom today after a long time, and she said that from the kitchen to the bathroom, the entire house was a mess. You've been cleaning up over there, haven't you? I was ticked off by his implication that I might be leisurely snacking and chilling out when visiting my mother-in-law's house. Of course I've been helping with the chores and shopping. I've even organized the fridge before leaving. My husband laughed scornfully and said, Well, I guess this is the most I can expect from a housewife, and glanced around the living room. It hasn't been long since our youngest son just moved out, so he may be right that the room isn't totally clean but it's not messy to the point that makes it hard to go about our usual days. My husband Robert has a nasty habit of nagging me about being a full-time housewife whenever he's in a bad mood. He always picks on the smallest things. If I stay silent, he assumes he's won the argument and cheerfully believes he's triumphed, which, of course, improves his mood. I often wonder if belittling his wife is really that satisfying for him. When he comes home from work tired, he'd demand, Get my dinner out on the table already. Seriously, can't you do anything without me telling you? That was Robert, always trying to assert his dominance. Then one day, I got a call from my sister-in-law. It seemed she had had a talk with Robert and she told me. Robert insists that if he moves in with mom, he should be able to sell the house and keep all the money to himself. Laura, are you planning to move in? If I had any hesitations about living with our mother-in-law, she offered to take her in instead. I told her, 
We just started discussing the possibility recently, to which she responded as if she had her own schemes in mind, so it's not confirmed yet then, and hung up. When I told Robert about this conversation, he became furious, barking, Why did you reveal our plans without asking me? I replied, saying, This is about discussing our mother's future, isn't it? You make it sound like a property dispute. He gave me a scornful look and sneered. I really hate dealing with idiots who can't think straight. This is what our relationship dynamic really is like for the most part. He'd belittle me for being a housewife and a high school graduate, always trying to make me submit to him. I was drawn to his confidence and reliability when we got married, but the things I loved about him have morphed into the things I loathe about him. What's worse, he'd occasionally boast about marrying an older woman, for me being two years older than him. He mocked me for not having a college degree and pushed me into being a housewife, claiming no one would want to hire a high school graduate. Ever since our children moved out, I've been feeling more and more stressed about my interactions with Robert. To be honest, I've been feeling as though I've reached my limit with this marriage. Robert, oblivious to my feelings, likely wants to move in with his mother as soon as possible, probably aiming to pocket all the money from selling her house. He doesn't seem to consider how his parents might feel about their home being sold or the memories they've built there. In the midst of these conflicting interests among family members, I encountered a shocking reality. It began with a call from my mother-in-law who had sprained her ankle. She said her room was in a mess and needed help cleaning it up. Although several days had passed since my sister-in-law had last visited, I figured that's what she was talking about the other day, so I responded lightly, Sure, I'll come over. It didn't seem like she had informed Robert, but she assured me I didn't need to let him know either. So I visited her with a light heart. The following day, I rang my mother-in-law's doorbell. I heard her shout, It's open! from the yard. I turned the knob and stepped into the entrance. An unpleasant odor was already noticeable. I saw dust accumulated in the corner of the corridor, with towels and discarded socks scattered around. The stench grew stronger as I entered the living room, where I found a stack of cushions piled on the sofa. Mm, my mother-in-law? Did she go somewhere? I murmured. Then I heard, I'm here, so I followed where the voice was coming from. There, I found my mother-in-law buried in a stack of cushions on the couch, which seemed to be adjusted for comfort. The cushions were piled up so high that I hadn't noticed she was there. Er, excuse me, Mom? Are you all right? I called out as I approached her. The peculiar smell grew stronger. Trying not to gag from the smell, I searched for its source. I'm okay. I just piled up the cushions because it's comfortable. She laughed heartily. I realized the source of the smell was my mother-in-law herself. With all my might, I tried not to pinch my nose and asked her, How's your leg? Were you unable to bathe because it was inconvenient? She replied, Ah, uh, yes, about that. I healed quickly. But after a few days of not bathing due to the pain, I couldn't be bothered to take a shower. Do I smell? I refrained from answering and said, I will clean up, and proceeded to open all the windows in the house. My mother-in-law certainly needed a thorough bath. Thinking this, I headed to the bathroom. The bathtub had some water filled and was left as is, with a lid half submerged. Soap scraps and towels were all muddy in the wash basin, and the mirror was foggy and dirty. I can't remember the last time I was here, but I wonder if my sister-in-law didn't visit in the meantime. I was puzzled how this could be neglected for so long, but for now, I cleaned the bathroom, filled up the tub with fresh water, added lemon bath salts for fragrance, and told my mother-in-law, I've just cleaned the bathroom and prepared a bath for you. Please, take a bath first. Meanwhile, I'll air these out, I said, pointing at the cushions my mother-in-law was buried in. The kitchen was in an appalling state. But the rest of the rooms were not that bad, with only a few layers of accumulated dust. The kitchen was filthy. It looked as though roaches might be lurking around, but I braced myself and cleaned it until it was spotless. That was refreshing, my mother-in-law, returning, said, as she came back to the living room. 
Her cheeks, flushed like a boiled lobster, glowed from having days of built-up dead skin washed off. Because I had been cleaning like crazy, the living room and kitchen were mostly tidied up. My mother-in-law was very pleased with the result. Finally, in the cleaned living room, I asked my mother-in-law, You were always so tidy and organized, Mom. What happened all of a sudden? Ever since I got married, my mother-in-law was always neat and her house was well-maintained, but this time it was a surprise to see her place in such a state to the point that she needed to call for help. So I straight up asked her. She said, Did you notice that I just used my injured foot as an excuse? I've been living with my husband for decades, doing my best as a wife and mother, but last year after my husband passed away, I felt a sudden sense of freedom. Her children were already independent and married. Her husband was no more here with her. She wanted to slack off and do nothing for once, she said. I also know that the kids want to sell this house, and it could escalate into a nasty fight over it. But I have an idea, my mother-in-law said, staring intensely as she shared her thoughts. My mother-in-law, out of her usual character, gave me a strong gaze as she opened up to me. As I listened to her, I felt like I had been idling away, lost in thought in an effort to find answers. Leaving her house, I began to think about my own future as well. So far, my relationship with my mother-in-law had only been as distant as a typical daughter-in-law and mother-in-law relationship, but the fact that it was not her biological daughter or son who she revealed her lowest self, I felt was indicative of my mother-in-law's feelings. Days passed without sharing this incident with anyone. After a while, my husband, Robert, came home from work and blurted out, We're going to invite my mom to live with us. As I was watching TV, I asked him to repeat himself, We're inviting my mom to move in with us. And what does your mom think? I asked. There's no need to ask her, he said. He seemed to think that any parent would be happy if their child offered them to move in with them. You should check with your mom first instead of just making decisions on your own. I suggested. But in response, he smirked, turning around. What a high and mighty thing to say for a stay-at-home wife. Don't forget, if you can't obey what I say, divorce is always on the table. Seeing his face, I felt at my wit's end. He knew that being a housewife and nearly in my fifties, I wouldn't be able to make it on my own if we divorced which is why he was threatening me with divorce, attempting to stir up my anxiety and manipulate me at his will. But I had an unexpected savior and unbeknownst to my husband, my life was about to take a dramatic turn. I ignored his provocative comment, finished dinner, and went to bed. My husband, feeling that he had completely cornered me with his divorce threat, was in a good mood. He's probably thinking of inviting his mother as planned, sweet talker into selling her house and pocket the money all to himself. The next morning, I packed my belongings and left the house. When Robert came home to find an empty house, he seemed startled, and my phone kept ringing. I read the incoming messages without responding, just so he wouldn't cause any trouble by reporting to the police or anything. The message Robert sent read, Are you so against living with my mom? But if we live together, that house will be ours. Don't you see how great that would be? My suspicion was right. His interest wasn't to stay with his aging mother to support her, but rather to profit off her house. I told this to my mother-in-law. She looked a little sad, and it pained me a bit. But she seemed determined and said she would act according to her feelings. Yes, the place I went after leaving my husband was my mother-in-law's house. I took on a job and was busy using this place as my base. Robert, growing anxious since I wasn't responding, blew up my phone with calls and texts. And after a week, he contacted my family in Nebraska, and I got a call from my mom. Laura, where are you? Robert claims that you're with us. He even said he's going to come get you even though I told him you're not here. I explained the situation to my mother and informed her that I'm currently staying at my in-law's house. My mother-in-law then took the phone, offering a long greeting. For some reason, my mother gave me a word of encouragement. 
wishing you the best of luck. Eventually, my mother-in-law said, It's about time. And that night, she called my husband, Robert. He was surprised to learn from his own mother that I was not at my parents' house and immediately came over to our place. Leaving the house so abruptly, I had no idea you were at Mom's. What's this about? Robert blurted out the moment he saw me at his mother's house. Before I could even answer, my mother-in-law spoke up. More than that, do you even understand why Laura left home? What was it really about? Taken aback by her sudden question, Robert awkwardly replied, Well, that was because I said I wanted to invite Mom over. Because she didn't want to live with you, right? Why would I be here if I didn't want to live with my mother-in-law? Ever thought about that? You see, it wasn't the idea of moving in with her that I disliked. What I hated was you for making selfish decisions without taking others' feelings into consideration. I continued. My mother-in-law has her own thoughts and hopes, you know. Despite this, you decided on living together without even discussing it with her. You didn't even consider the feelings of your parents when they built this house. You just want this house because you want the money, right? Robert clenched his fist and hardened his body, looking down as he listened to our conversation. My mother-in-law continued after me. What do you really need? This house? Or Laura? If you don't change, you'll lose both. Why don't you cool down for a while and rethink everything? Hearing this from his own mother, Robert, who had been quietly listening, suddenly kneeled to the ground in front of us. I was taken aback and asked, What's this about? I apologize. To Laura and to you, Mom. Please, I want to live together again and start anew. Raising his head from his bow, Robert continued, Mom, will you live with us? As Robert bowed down again, I looked at my mother-in-law and we shared a knowing smirk. After that, I resumed my life with Robert. But this time, I wasn't a stay-at-home wife anymore. My mother-in-law told her friends about how I deep-cleaned her room, a whole mess from the time she spent lazing around, just within a couple of hours. When I mentioned this to my friends, many of them said they wanted you to do the same for their homes. I was amazed and delighted to find that I could apply my housekeeping skills from being a stay-at-home wife to start a new job. I also began studying to become a storage advisor. It seemed that Robert had not given up on the idea of living with his mother, selling their house and getting a large amount of money. He seemed to think that it would become a reality now that my mother-in-law and I were getting along, but there was a surprise announcement from my mother-in-law. Surprisingly, she was getting remarried. So I won't be living with you, and I won't be giving up my house either. Upon hearing the news, my sister-in-law congratulated her, although with mixed feelings. I sent my sincere blessings for my mother-in-law's decision. The one who was surprised by my mother-in-law's words and screamed out in shock was Robert. At the same time, he was frantically contacting various people. Apparently, Robert had taken a boating license without telling me and even purchased a small cruiser, counting on the money from selling his parents' house. Now that his plans had fallen apart, Robert was unable to cancel his order for the cruiser, and he seemed to have to work even harder than before. He ended up having to help me with my house cleaning job. As an employer, I'm drilling household chores to Robert and guiding him to clean and polish a great number of my clients' houses. I was always a low-key person, but I decided to go all out with my makeup for my high school reunion. Turns out, no one even remembered me. Excuse me, who are you? The voice belonged to Jennifer, who had been doing amateur modeling since high school. Wow, you're so caked up. I can't even recognize you. Uh-huh. Unbelievably, Jennifer splashed her cup of water on my face. With my makeup gone, I suddenly felt vulnerable, as if a spell had been broken. Just then, I heard murmurs from my classmates. Wait, are you? Yes, 
I'm not the same person I used to be. My name is Sarah, a 20-year-old studying literature at a private university. While many college girls are into fashion, I've never been interested. I'm still that low-key person. People say you get into fashion in college, but that's never been me. Even in college, I look the same as I did in high school. I only tuck my hair behind my ears when eating. Otherwise, my face is mostly hidden. And that's fine by me. Being inconspicuous, almost like air, suits me just fine. I've loved reading since I was a kid. In elementary school, while everyone else ran to the playground, I headed to the library. I can't remember if I loved books first or if I went to the library to fill a lonely void, but I definitely love reading. Inside books, there's a world that I don't know about. Books add color to my otherwise monotonous life. Reading was my only hobby, especially since I wasn't good at sports or socializing. In high school, reading wasn't enough, so I started writing novels. I would hide behind my long hair and secretly observe people for story ideas. In my world, exciting things are always happening, things I'll never experience. Just like reading books, observing the real world was fascinating. Sarah, tuck your hair behind your ears. No one can talk to you if they can't see your face. Well, I guess I'm the only one who would. Uh -huh. Jennifer, who was way out of my league, would occasionally come over to my desk to talk. She was an amateur model, known as the rich high schooler. I never understood why Jennifer picked on me. But she wasn't bullying me, just teasing. She was indeed pretty and wore high-end brands. But she never became material for my novels, so I ignored her. My hobby of writing novels, which started in high school, continues to this day, and I even post my works online. One day after college, I dashed off to a publishing house in Boston. The scenery from this unusual train ride seemed more vivid than usual. Oh man, I'm so nervous. For the past week, my heart has been racing, and it's all I can do to keep my composure. My heart is pounding and it's reaching its peak now. Next, please. Nice to meet you. I've been a fan of Miss Williams since middle school. I poured my feelings into those words, probably speaking more openly than I ever had before. By the way, Miss Williams is the author Emily Williams, whom I adore. Today, her new book launch event is happening at this publishing house. You have a way with words, dear. Thank you for loving my work so much. Keep challenging yourself to broaden your horizons. Miss Williams said, signing her new book for me. As I walked away, still on cloud nine, a man near the entrance of the publishing house stopped me. Little did I know that this encounter would change my life. He gave me a special makeup set, and strangely enough, it sparked an interest in makeup, something I had never cared about. From then on, I started waking up a little earlier to do my makeup before going to college. It's strange. When I put on makeup, my face naturally lifts, and my perspective broadens. I realized that the world, which I thought was always the same, actually changes from moment to moment. Makeup isn't just about looking good. It's more than that. One day, as I was feeling this newfound joy and curiosity, I found an invitation to my high school reunion in the mail. Ah, a reunion, huh? The old me would have sighed and debated whether to go. But now, I feel a slight urge to attend. Encouraged by Miss Williams' words to keep challenging yourself, I decided to go to the reunion. On the day, I opened the makeup set and saw various eyeshadows, lipsticks, and blushes I had never used. 
Should I go a bit more glamorous for the reunion? I chose some bold colors I usually wouldn't use. Before I knew it, I had applied heavy makeup like a stage actress. Well, no one will remember my face anyway, I thought, and headed to the reunion in a new dress I bought for the occasion. Technically, you need my agency's permission to take a photo with me, but I'll let it slide today. When I arrived, Jennifer was already the center of attention, tipsy and more flamboyant than ever. She had transitioned from amateur modeling to professional appearing in magazines, which I had seen a year ago. Impressive indeed. While I didn't necessarily want to be like Jennifer, I admired her for her boldly expressing herself. As for me, people who passed by barely nodded, clearly not remembering me. I guess that's to be expected. Why would they remember someone they never spoke to? Even though it was a predictable reaction, I felt a bit sad. Excuse me, who are you? Just then, Jennifer, who had noticed me standing at the entrance, came over with a cup of water. She looked closely at my face, chuckled, and then the next moment, something cold splashed on my face. Hey, what are you doing? In a flash, I didn't know what had happened but Jennifer splashed water from her cup onto my face. The room fell silent. I can't even recognize you with all that overdone makeup. <laughs> Jennifer's voice echoed through the room. Unfazed by the reactions around her, she showed me the empty cup and laughed. <laughs> what just happened? So cold. What does my face look like now? I wiped my face with a handkerchief, only to find it smeared with makeup. So my makeup is ruined. Suddenly I felt vulnerable, as if a spell had been broken. Then voices from my classmates. Hey, haven't we seen her on TV? Wait, are you related to Tommy Haywood? Before I knew it, a crowd had gathered around me. Jennifer was even more surprised, and lost for words. You see, I had recently made my TV debut. On my way back from Miss Williams' new book launch, a man approached me. It was Tommy Haywood, a world-renowned makeup artist. He had been in another room at the publishers, doing an interview. In today's world, beauty interests both men and women, and Tommy Haywood's show boasts top ratings in the beauty genre. Even I, who knew little about beauty and makeup, had heard of him. When Tommy Haywood approached me near the entrance after the event, I was shocked. I'm borrowing her. With that, he grabbed my arm and led me to an empty conference room, not minding my surprise. Um, don't worry, I'll give you a makeover. Tommy Haywood sat me down, removed his glasses, and did my makeup in just a few minutes. Finally, he fixed my hair. Take a look. I was amazed when I looked into the hand mirror he handed me. Wow, I look beautiful. Even the people from the publishing house were surprised by my transformation. How about becoming my exclusive model? What? Exclusive model? I instinctively shook my head at the unfamiliar proposition. Why not? Meeting you here today is fate. I'm so proud of how beautiful you've become with my makeup. Let's inspire women around the world together. I was indeed grateful for the incredible makeover and happy to have met someone so famous. But I don't want to stand out. I've lived my life avoiding attention. And I'm comfortable that way. Hearing my words, Tommy Haywood slowly shook his head. You should believe in your potential and have the courage to step into the wider world. Think about it. With that, Tommy Haywood gifted me his contact information and a custom makeup set. That's the makeup set I'm using now. For days after, Tommy Haywood's words stuck in my mind. Not just him, 
Ms. Williams had said something similar. Broaden your horizons. Take on new challenges. Let's give it a try. I made up my mind and called Tommy Haywood. From then on, I left everything to him. One thing led to another, and I became a regular model on Tommy Haywood's show. On the show, I revealed my bare face and underwent an incredible transformation thanks to his magic touch. It seems someone here had seen that episode. Oh, it's Sarah. Sarah, you're Tommy Haywood's exclusive model. That's amazing. Tell us the story. My classmates started talking to me one after another. I have a better modeling career than you. Just then, Jennifer's voice, full of resentment, echoed through the room. She was glaring at us from outside the circle of people. My classmates, who had seen Jennifer splash water on me, looked at her with disdain. You should thank me. I'm the one who removed your overdone makeup so people could recognize you. She showed no signs of remorse. That's when Robert, the class heartthrob, stepped in front of Jennifer, showing her his phone. Jennifer, you're so boring. Most of your Instagram photos are stock images, aren't they? What are you talking about, Robert? That's not true. Well, the American store you posted about recently has been under renovation for months. And someone saw you in Boston just a few hours before you claimed to be in Paris. Robert continued to press a flustered Jennifer. You're not actually getting any modeling gigs, are you? That's mean. Jennifer, visibly shaken, couldn't bear the cold stares from her classmates and stormed out of the room. Lies catch up to you, don't they? One classmate muttered. I later heard that many classmates had been following Jennifer's Instagram and were growing tired of her fake posts. Sarah, you dropped this earlier. Robert handed me Ms. Williams' book, which had fallen out of my bag when Jennifer splashed water on me. Thank you. After that, I talked more with classmates than I had in all three years of high school. Talking to people around me wasn't as hard as I thought. Everyone has their own thoughts, their own way of living, and their own uncertainties. I knew this, of course, but hearing it directly from people felt different than reading it in a book. I'm glad I attended the reunion. I'm truly glad I mustered the courage back then. As for Jennifer, I heard she got fired from her modeling agency. Someone had posted a video of her splashing water on me at the reunion, and it went viral, causing a backlash. Social media can be scary. While I question the person who posted the video, I hope Jennifer learns to live without lying to herself. Three years have passed since then. This is Sarah. Could you come over now? The call led me back to the publishing house where I'd first met Tommy Haywood and talked to Miss Williams three years ago. That day, in this place, my life changed dramatically. As I was lost in thought, a voice came from behind me. Are you Miss Sarah, the writer? Writer? Me? Yes. Your novel is going to be published. You're making your debut as a novelist. Really? I was so surprised that I kept asking for confirmation. Ever since gaining confidence, I had been sending my own novels to the publishing house. One of them caught the attention of the higher-ups, and now it's going to be a book. From now on, you'll be a beauty expert and a writer. You'll be busy. We'll schedule a meeting for next week. Looking forward to working with you, Miss Sarah. Likewise, thank you. Being called a writer still tickles me a bit. Will I ever get used to it? No, never forget where you started. As I stepped outside, the warm glow of the sunset enveloped me. The building housing the publishing company was also bathed in the colors of the setting sun. This place is indeed special to me. I'm glad I took that courageous step back then. Otherwise, I might still be hiding behind my hair.
living in a limited world. I wouldn't have been able to see this beautiful view or be a part of the exciting things happening around me. Of course, books are still my dear friends. But now, I want to write books that give hope to those who lack courage, just like I did. Facing the setting sun, I made that resolution. Good morning. Good morning. I hope we find a great venue today. Yeah. Today, I'm going venue hunting for our wedding with the man who recently proposed to me. The man, that man, is Robert, whom I reconnected with at the reunion three years ago. Robert, who picked up the book I had dropped. We've been in touch since then and found out we both love reading, especially Ms. Williams' books. Robert, the class heartthrob, turned out to be someone I could relate to. Being with him makes my heart race, the world around me shines, and I feel at ease. New emotions are stirring within me. Found another idea for a novel, haven't you? Robert peered into my face. You noticed? Come on, let's go. No work talk today. Our wedding is our own special story. Don't turn it into a novel. Oh, come on. Let's share our happiness. Our voices echoed in the air. Hand in hand, Robert and I stepped into the pristine wedding venue. My name is Kristen. I live with my husband, Morris, and our daughter, Noelle. Noelle is 10 years old, and she's grown into a lively and kind-hearted girl. From the outside, our family probably looks like a happy one. But the truth is, the relationship between Morris and me had fallen apart a long time ago. I met Morris at work. When we were dating, Morris was a very kind person, slender, handsome, and charming. He cared for me so much that when he proposed, I was overjoyed to the point of tears. I thought we could live happily ever after as a married couple. I realized I was wrong a few months after our wedding. I discovered that Morris was nothing but a lazy person who only looked good on the outside. He never did any housework, and he just lazed around on his days off. Because of this lifestyle, he quickly lost his good looks and became as big as a bear. Whenever I asked him to help with the housework, he would yell, It's your job. You're a stay-at-home wife. I became too scared to say anything. Becoming a stay-at-home wife was something Morris asked me to do when we got married. He told me, It's been my dream to have my wife welcome me home, and I couldn't refuse him. So I quit my job, but I regretted it soon after our marriage. He would say, You're a stay-at-home wife. So it's natural for you to do all this. And he would force all the housework on me. He also told me not to go out on my own, saying, Stay at home wives might cheat. And I felt trapped in the house. A few months into our marriage, I wanted to leave Morris. But then I found out I was pregnant. Morris was truly happy about the child. I struggled with whether or not to divorce Morris, but I chose to continue our marriage, hoping that having a child might change him. I realized that choice was a mistake as soon as Noel was born. Morris seemed to love Noel, but he left all the child care to me. Moreover, he started coming home late on weekdays and started going out without a word on weekends. I suspected he was cheating, and it didn't take long to find out it was true. Morris was having an affair, but didn't even bother to hide his mobile phone. 
I often saw texts from someone named Donna. Perhaps Morris wanted to flaunt his affair to me. When I asked, Who's Donna? Morris smirked and said, You're better off not knowing. Divorcing now would be hard on Noel. And besides, Kristen, you have no way to make money. I knew Morris was cheating, but I couldn't pursue it any further. Exhausted from daily housework and childcare, I began to feel worthless. I felt so worthless that I even thought it was natural for Morris to cheat on me. I was very depressed at that time. I also hesitated to take Noelle's father away from her, as Morris said, and above all, I had no qualifications or skills. I was hired by the company I worked for before marriage thanks to being a fresh graduate, but I felt that finding a new job after not working for a while would be difficult. When Noelle got a little older, I asked Morris if I could work part-time. I wanted to divorce Morris, and I wanted to gain the ability to earn money on my own. But Morris was furious at this suggestion. You're planning to cheat on me if you go out. I won't let Kristen go out at all. And it would be pitiful to Noelle if you work without taking care of her. He yelled, rejecting my request. My parents had passed away early. And being an only child, I had no one to turn to. I didn't have the courage to make the decision to divorce Morris in an environment where I wasn't even allowed to go out freely. So, I started doing something without Morris finding out. Then one day, I received news that my father-in-law had collapsed and was hospitalized. Father-in-law had been living alone since my mother-in-law passed away. Morris allowed me to visit father-in-law, so I went to see him almost every day. I won't deny that I wanted to go out, but I genuinely cared for father-in-law. Father-in-law was a very gentle person, like a sage. Even after we were married, he always looked out for me, saying, Morris can be selfish. So it must be hard for you, Kristen. Father-in-law always welcomed me and Noel with joy when we visited him. Imagining parting with father-in-law, who was getting weaker every day, I would tear up. And father-in-law would always smile and say, It's okay. I'm just going to where my wife is waiting. When Noel was little, Father-in-law often came to visit me when I was feeling overwhelmed. He took good care of Noelle and even told me, If life with Morris is hard, you should divorce him any time. When father-in-law's condition became critical, Morris brought someone home. Um, who is this? In the middle of a weekday, while Noelle was still at school, Morris brought home a young woman. Morris introduced her with pride. This is Donna, my mistress. I was dumbfounded, wondering why he would bring his mistress home when he knew I was there. Donna smiled and said, Nice to meet you. I was irritated, but I asked Morris, What's going on? And he casually replied, I'm thinking of divorcing you. So I thought Kristen might want to know what my mistress looks like. I don't feel attracted to you anymore. So take Noelle and leave. I'm going to marry Donna. Why all of a sudden? I already knew that Morris didn't see me as a woman. I couldn't understand why he decided to divorce me at this timing. Morris grinned like a devil. Because my father is going to die soon... If I don't divorce you now, I'll have to share the inheritance with you when I do. Father-in-law was a landowner and had worked for a large corporation until he retired. So he had considerable wealth. I understood why Morris would want a large inheritance. But I never thought he would push for a divorce just because he didn't want to share it with me. 
Morris never visited father-in-law in the hospital. He always said, "I wish my father would die soon and give me the money." I was always angry at these words because I cared for father-in-law. But when Morris said he wanted to divorce me to keep all the inheritance, my pent-up anger exploded. Fine, let's divorce. Noel and I will leave tonight. You and Donna be happy," I said with a smile and quickly began to pack. Morris was stunned. Finally, he asked anxiously, "Are you really okay with divorcing?" "I'm just doing what Morris said," I replied with a smile and filled out the divorce papers Morris had prepared. "Hey, Christian, how can you divorce so easily?" You don't have any qualifications, and you can't work. Morris was clearly flustered by my calm demeanor. He must have thought I would cry and beg him. Looking at the confused Morris, I laughed and said, "I'm earning enough. I've been writing essay comics. I've been published and received a lot of royalties." Morris said, "What?" Looking puzzled. So I handed him and Donna one of my essay comics. The comic detailed all the various things my husband had done, the something I had started doing without Morris finding out was uploading these comics to social media. I had always loved drawing and thought I could make a living with my illustration skills. Reading the essay comic, Morris began to tremble and shouted, "What is this?" You're the worst for drawing me without permission. I think I'm better than someone who wants to divorce to monopolize their parents' inheritance. I replied firmly. Morris opened his mouth to say something else, but Donna spoke first. Um, is this true? Reading the essay comic, Donna's face turned pale. I smiled broadly and nodded. Yes. Morris is the kind of person who locks his wife in the house and doesn't let her out. He barely gives enough for living expenses, and he tells me to pay for our child's hospital bills from that. When I run out and ask for more, he yells at me for wasting money. As I explained the page Donna was reading, confirming that the essay comic was true, Donna said, "Wait, let me think about the marriage." And left the house. Morris tripped and fell as he stood up, shouting, "Donna, wait for me!" He hit his head, and groaned in pain. His reaction was so funny that I couldn't help but laugh. Morris turned bright red and yelled, "It's all your fault!" Before running after Donna, in his haste, he left the divorce papers behind. So I decided to submit them myself. I explained the situation to Noel when she came home, and we left. Noel understood that we were divorcing and that she wouldn't see Morris anymore, but she was more worried about not seeing father-in-law. Can't we visit Grandpa anymore? I think it's fine to visit Grandpa as usual, since your father probably won't go there. I answered. And Noel looked genuinely happy. After submitting the divorce papers at the courthouse, Noel and I, having nowhere else to go, visited father-in-law. We asked if we could live with him until we found a place to rent, and father-in-law immediately agreed. He apologized for Morris's behavior, saying, "My son has done something truly inexcusable." Within a month, father-in-law passed away. Noel and I were grieving, but Morris's constant anger towards me was a real nuisance. Apparently, Donna had left him because of the essay comic, and he was angry, saying, "It's your fault." But he also bragged, "Now all of my father's inheritance is mine." I was disgusted with myself for ever marrying such a person. A few days after father-in-law's death, Morris called me at lunchtime. "Hey, you must have deceived my father. 
I had no idea what he was talking about and asked, What do you mean? My father gave away all his inheritance. And he left a will saying that the only thing he kept, the house, goes to Kristen. I was shocked by father-in-law's will. And Morris yelled, Come here now! When I rushed to the house, I found Morris and a lawyer in the messy home, left untidy since there was no one to clean. The will shown to me by the lawyer indeed stated that the house was left to me, and father-in-law had left me a letter. Kristen, I'm truly sorry for the trouble Morris has caused. I've donated all the inheritance, but I want to leave the house to you. Please accept it as my small way of making amends for raising a child like Morris. Thank you for everything. Morris had read the letter and even accused me. Were you having an affair with my father? I won't stand for this nonsense, I exclaimed through tears. Father-in-law has been worried about you all this time, and yet you never visited him once, only wanting his inheritance. You're a despicable person. Perhaps surprised by my tearful outburst, Morris stood dumbfounded beside me, while the lawyer explained the procedure for receiving the inheritance. Morris muttered, But it's my house. But the lawyer told him, Legally, this house belongs to Kristen, and he was left speechless. Noel and I had planned to find a rental and move, but we decided to live in the house that father-in-law had left us. Life with Noel was peaceful, and she seemed happy. I had endured the marriage for Noel's sake, but I regretted not divorcing sooner. As for Morris, he was later arrested. He had broken up with Donna, but then became a stalker. He followed Donna, begging her to marry him, and he even broke into her house. This led to legal trouble, and he was forced to resign from his job. Morris lost his job and Donna due to a restraining order. He managed to rent a small apartment room after selling the house we had lived in, but he struggled to find work. The reason I knew this was because Morris had broken into the house I had inherited. Living a poor life in his apartment, Morris broke a window to enter crying. Help me, Kristen! I immediately turned him over to the police. It seems that Morris, who is on probation, will now face actual imprisonment. I hope he can correct his twisted personality while paying for his crimes. As for me, I turned this divorce drama with my husband into a comic. And it's going to be published again. Sales are good. And it's already going into a second printing. I've started receiving requests from clients who want me to do illustrations and comics. Thinking that I was able to acquire a skill to support Noel without Morris knowing makes me proud of myself back then. If you can't even clean properly, maybe you should just have an abortion. I mean, it doesn't bother me either way. How could you say such a thing? Unforgivable. Just too far. My name is Alicia. I'm in my late 30s and I'm a company worker. I've been married to my husband Kevin for five years now. We don't have any kids yet. When we were getting married, Kevin said, We're not getting any younger and we both want kids, so I'd like you to stay at home and quit your job. But I just couldn't give up my current job, so we've both been working. Now Kevin understands how I feel and we're living harmoniously, sharing household chores. Even the notion of moving in with my in-laws was brought up once. My mother-in-law used to be a teacher. She said that when Kevin and I have a child, she'll help so I can continue working while raising the child. Her parents helped her when she was raising her children while working, and she wanted to pass on the support. For now, we're leaving things at, we'll think about it once we're blessed with a child. Kevin is quite dominant and expects me to follow a step behind him, especially around his family. Despite that, he is inherently kind and we maintained an equal relationship at home. 
Lately, my health has been less than stellar. My stomach has been upset, I've been suffering from dizzy spells, and I'm irritable. At the end of my workday, I'm exhausted and I can barely manage the household chores. Kevin has been very concerned despite being tired from his own work. He helps with my share of chores, asks me what I feel like eating, and even goes out of his way to buy it. However, my health kept deteriorating, so he said, you should see a doctor. If it's too much to go alone, I'll accompany you. I'm worried, please. He accompanied me to the doctor, and it turned out that I was pregnant. The cause of my poor health was morning sickness. Both Kevin and I were overjoyed at our long-awaited pregnancy. We thought this morning sickness would surely calm down soon. However, even after a month, two months, my morning sickness did not subside. I learned that the severity and duration of morning sickness vary greatly among individuals, and some people even suffer from it until they give birth. My health worsened day by day. I managed to go to work, but I could no longer do any housework after returning home. Seeing this, Kevin began to grow cold towards me. Why isn't your morning sickness over yet? It's not an illness, is it? Are you pretending to suffer so you could slack off from housework? I don't know why either. Why would you say such terrible things? That's harsh. My mother said she never had morning sickness. My colleagues at work said it was over quickly and they were doing housework. Alicia, you're just being lazy. If you toughen up, you won't feel morning sickness, right? You're lacking determination. I wanted to argue back at Kevin who compared me with his mother and others, accusing me of slacking off, but I didn't have the energy to do so at the time. I was coming home from work, barely managing the household chores, while feeling dizzy and sometimes vomiting in the toilet. Kevin would finish his share of the chores, then he'd lie on the sofa, watching TV and laughing while I was desperately trying to do the housework. Even when I asked for a little help, he would say, at least take responsibility for your own work. Morning sickness isn't an illness. If you pull yourself together, you can handle it. It's only hard because you think it is. If you're like this with morning sickness, how will you manage childcare? And wouldn't help me. After a while, Kevin fell asleep on the sofa and his smartphone slipped from his hand. The screen showed a message asking, has Alicia's slacking off habit been cured? I was furious. Using Kevin's finger while he was sleeping, I unlocked the fingerprinted protected phone and I found numerous emails from my mother-in-law in the mailbox. Has Alicia's slacking off habit been cured? She's just using morning sickness as an excuse to slack off. She's planning to slack off in her work and housework. You have to hit her hard. I see. I'll tell her. I've never had morning sickness at all. As long as you're careful, you'll be fine. I see. I'll tell Alicia too. Morning sickness is nothing compared to childcare, which is a hundred times harder. I'm worried about what will happen after the baby is born if she's like this now. That's troublesome. They also talked about how I was too old and questioned whether a healthy child could be born. They even suggested Kevin should remarry a younger woman who would not suffer from morning sickness and would bear a healthy child. You don't have such a partner in mind, do you? Oh, if you feel like it, I'll introduce her to you, okay? Her name is Mona. She's my student and she's 25 now. She admired me and became a teacher. She's so cute. It's fulfilling and it doesn't have to be a burden on you, Kevin. If it's Mona, I think she'll definitely do it if I ask her to live with me. I wouldn't mind if you introduced me to her. They even made plans for a meal with Mona, one of my mother-in-law's former students. Regularly, they were bad-mouthing me. I managed to take a picture of all the emails and save them when I had a chance to check Kevin's phone. I was stunned for a while and couldn't comprehend what I had seen, but I felt I understood why my husband had grown colder towards me. That day, I couldn't get out of the toilet from morning till evening. My morning sickness showed no signs of calming down, and my throat was sore from all the vomiting. I worried whether the baby in my belly was alright given my condition. Recently, I have barely been able to eat solid food and have just been managing to stay hydrated. Feeling my lemon, I was about to call Kevin from the bathroom for help when he showed up at the bathroom door by chance. I am really suffering today, please take me to the hospital. Maybe an IV drip will make me feel better. Why are you fussing over a little morning sickness? It's already enough! I have plans today, please don't bother me. I remembered, today he had plans to dine with my mother-in-law and Mona. I wanted to tail them, but that seemed out of the question now. I plan to go out in the evening, but seeing you, Alicia, depresses me. I'm leaving now. I can't even relax in my own house. Just keep slacking off alone, alright? Why are you always so cruel? The child inside me is ours, Kevin. Can't you cooperate or help a little? <laughs> if morning sickness prevents you from even cleaning properly, maybe you should just get rid of the child. I don't really care either way. You're choosing to have this baby, Alicia, right? 
Then stop complaining and handle your business. Just don't burden me, okay? As I heard his words, my consciousness began to drift away. I couldn't muster any strength. When I woke up, I was in a hospital. My parents looked at me worriedly. What had happened? Apparently, when I was trying to call Kevin from the bathroom using my phone, I accidentally dialed home. My father answered the phone and overheard Kevin's harsh words. My parents rushed to our place immediately and found me collapsed alone in the bathroom. Kevin had left me unconscious and gone out. My parents quickly called an ambulance and I was taken to the hospital. Fortunately, both I and the baby were okay, but I was advised to stay in the hospital for a night just to be sure. My parents tried to reach Kevin, but he was unresponsive. He had read the messages but didn't reply. He didn't show up at the hospital that day. I told my parents everything, sobbing. I showed them all the photos from Kevin's phone. My father, deep in thought, said, We need to talk with Kevin and his parents. The next morning, when I was about to be discharged, Kevin finally showed up in my hospital room. Kevin, grinning, said, Seriously? What are you being hospitalized for? You just stayed one night, right? See, I told you, your morning sickness isn't a big deal. Let's go home now. Kevin, wait a moment. The doctor told me something earlier. I got a medical certificate that recommends rest due to my condition. I've already contacted my workplace to take leave starting tomorrow. Oh well, so you're slacking off from work now too? Must be nice. This morning sickness thing. Well, it makes sense. You would be a burden to everyone at work in this condition. So if you're going to be home from tomorrow, I don't need to do the chores, right? It's only fair since you're going to be home slacking off. Kevin, have you been talking to your dad recently? Does he know about Alicia's condition? Well, no, I haven't talked to my dad recently. I do keep in touch with my mom and I've told her about the situation, so I think she has informed my dad. Considering Alicia's situation and your current attitude, Kevin, I cannot allow her to return home. We will take Alicia in for a while. What? Don't spoil Alicia, please. Well, we are sorry, but regarding this matter, we need to apologize to your parents. We would like to visit when your father is present. Also, what happened last night? We tried contacting you multiple times. Or perhaps you were too busy with work? I wonder if Kevin noticed that my mom's eyes were not smiling even though she was. He made a tense face and said, Okay, I understand. I'll make arrangements. Last night I was working. I've been busy recently. Excuse me. And he left the room. Then the doctor came for the final check before discharging me. After finishing the examination, the doctor explained how I should take care of myself from tomorrow onwards. He then addressed Kevin. You're Alicia's husband, right? Alicia is going through a tough time right now, so please take care of her. Try to do the chores so that she can rest her body. To which Kevin replied, Doctor, what are you talking about? It's just morning sickness. Well, I understand from your position you have to say that to avoid complaints, right? Don't worry, I'll make sure Alicia does what she needs to do. When we have a family meeting, my parents will surely reprimand her too. Now, if you'll excuse me. And he left. The doctor, puzzled, offered, he seems to misunderstand something. Should I explain it to him more thoroughly? My mother responded with a smile. No, it's all right. We'll handle this on our end. I'm sorry for the unpleasant scene you had to witness. My parents seemed lost in quiet contemplation. A month passed and my health finally began to stabilize. The time had come to go to Kevin's family home and resolve things once and for all. That said, I hadn't been in touch with Kevin much in the months since I had returned home, and I had no idea how far things had progressed with Mona. I had no clue where the discussion would lead. I'm sorry for the inconvenience caused by my extended stay at my parents' home due to morning sickness. It's not a bother at all. Are you feeling better now? Be careful not to push yourself too hard. While my father-in-law expressed concern for my health, Kevin and my mother-in-law gave me condescending smirks. Thank you. In fact, Kevin mentioned that Alicia's morning sickness was an act of indulgence, which is distressing for us as her parents. Eh? Morning sickness as an indulgence? Kevin, did you say that? Uh, well, isn't that right, Mom? No, it just seems to be lasting too long. You're better now, aren't you, Alicia? That's good. My mother-in-law hastily tried to end the conversation. No, we need to clarify this, mother-in-law. You are worried that Alicia, being older, might not be able to give birth to a healthy child. You plan to arrange a remarriage between your young former student and Kevin? How far have the discussions with this young uh, Miss Mona, was it, progressed? Eh? What is this all about? Has my wife really said such a disrespectful thing? No, it's not like that. It was a joke. A joke. Eh? A joke? Mom, what do you mean? We've already had a meal with Mona, and I really like her. After this, we will divorce Alicia for failing to do housework and clean alimony. Then I will marry Mona, right? At Kevin's words, everyone fell silent. An uneasy silence filled the air. My mother-in-law turned pale, and my father-in-law was red in the face. 
It seems there has been some outrageous discussions happening without my knowledge. For today, please go home. I will have a proper conversation with these two. I apologize for the situation. Once again, I ended up returning to my parents' house. I felt like I might never return to that house again. A few days later, I learned a surprising fact from my father. Kevin had received disciplinary action from his company. The reason was maternity harassment. He had committed maternity harassment against a woman in his department. It's evidence that you're slacking off if you get sick just because you're pregnant. Work is not your place to relax. If you don't want to work, then go home. He would assign heavy lifting tasks to visibly pregnant women. Can't you even do this? You're just a burden on the company. Ugh, you should just quit already. You're a nuisance to everyone. Apparently, it was awful. There were several victims, and they seemed to have reported him to the company's compliance department. My father, who has connections with Kevin's company, apparently got the information. Kevin said, But mom taught me that. I just said what mom said. What's wrong with that? I think the same way in my heart, but in public, I pretend to be kind to pregnant women and worry about them if they're not feeling well. Don't you understand that? Then you knew that even if you thought so, you shouldn't say it out loud to Alicia, right? Why did you say such a thing to Kevin? Why did you do something that would lead to their divorce? Kevin seemed to understand nothing, so I thought I could guide him to divorce. I thought Mona, being young, would listen to me. She admires me after all, and I'm sure she'll agree to live with us. Alicia is just too headstrong and I don't prefer. It seemed my mother-in-law had arranged everything behind the scenes. My father-in-law didn't know anything and Kevin was just a pawn in her game. Afterwards, I was incessantly contacted by Kevin. I was deceived by mom. I was just misunderstood. I didn't know anything. Please forgive me. I will treasure you and our baby from now on. Oh, just the other day you were telling me to get rid of this baby, weren't you? It's too late to start caring now. We're getting a divorce. Please live happily with Mona. We had this back and forth many times. Kevin's words, just get rid of it, that I had heard while I was fainting deeply wounded my heart. It was something I simply couldn't forgive. On the other hand, I learned that Mona was not aware of Kevin's marital status and had only agreed to have dinner with him because my mother-in-law suggested it, assuring her it would avoid complications at work. Apparently, she didn't become a teacher because she admired my mother-in-law, nor did she hold any particular affection for her. When she found out about my mother-in-law's manipulation, she was genuinely shocked and looked down on her. She had just been unwittingly dragged into all of this. I was worried that getting a divorce would be difficult, but my father-in-law stepped in. He scolded and persuaded both Kevin and my mother-in-law, and we were able to finalize the divorce. I deeply regret that Kevin hurt you in such a difficult time of pregnancy. As a father, I feel extremely guilty. I am also sorry for my wife's actions and for not having monitored her properly, which caused a great deal of discomfort. He apologized from his heart. He paid for Kevin's alimony and child support in a lump sum and apparently planned to make Kevin repay him in installments. I was able to smoothly finalize the divorce thanks to you, father-in-law. Please come visit us when the baby is born. I'd love to, but hold off for now. I need to straighten out Kevin and my wife and keep a close watch on them. Besides, if they found out I was secretly meeting you, they might go off the rails again. I don't want to expose you or my grandchild's any more danger. Kevin resigned from his job, which he had been disciplined at. He said it was too hard to stay at the company. He tried to find another job, but seemed to be having a hard time sticking to one. He's living with his mother under his father's watchful eye, and it seems he's having a rough time. Rumors about Mona's situation spread in my mother-in-law's workplace, and it seems everyone is giving her strange looks. The teaching world is a rapid turnover of school reassignments every three to eight years, which apparently makes it easier for rumors to spread. Even without this rumor, my mother-in-law is already a dubious person, so people around her were likely thinking she might do something like this. I wonder if she was shocked to find out that Mona, whom she thought admired her, actually disliked her. Lately, she seems to have become very quiet at work. After safely giving birth to a girl, as expected, Kevin pleaded, Please let me see my daughter. I have a right since I'm paying child support. I responded formally. Child support payments and visitation rights are separate legal obligations and not exchangeable. We decided during the divorce that you would pay child support and we would not have visitation. Therefore, I decline your request for a visit. After that, he stopped contacting me. However, sometimes I wonder if it was right to deprive my child of her father based on my feelings. After all, it was my mother-in-law who was the real mastermind and Kevin was merely brainwashed. When I confessed this story to my mother, she said, Indeed, Kevin is a kind person, but I wonder, who is he the kindest to? If he's kindest to you and his daughter, it might be okay to let him see her. What do you think? Indeed, Kevin is kind, but he's the kindest to himself. Or rather, he's only kind to himself. That's why when I was sick and became a burden to his life, he was filled with negative feelings towards me and ended up going along with my mother-in-law's plan. 
I can't trust the person who pushed me away when I was weak and needed help. I might ask my daughter if she wants to meet him when she's old enough to have her own opinions. But until then, I don't plan to let her see him. My world completely changed after my daughter was born. Parenting is really fun, but it's also very challenging. I plan to take maternity leave for a while to focus on parenting, and then return to work after leaving my daughter at daycare. I decided to live at my parents' house during my maternity leave. I'm considering finding an apartment near my parents' house where I can live with my daughter soon. Since then, I secretly contacted my father-in-law and asked him to visit us once without informing Kevin. Seeing him carefully and tenderly lift my daughter in his arms, I couldn't help but wish he could visit more often. He didn't take any photos of my daughter. He said if he took any, he might keep looking at them at home and then his wife and Kevin would find out. Instead, I took a lot of pictures of him and my daughter together. I plan to make an album and present it to him one day. I'm incredibly fortunate. I have the support of my parents and a job to return to. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if my morning sickness had been lighter and I had continued to live with Kevin. Would he have cooperated with me when childcare became difficult, thinking of our daughter and working together to overcome challenges? Would he have risked his own life to protect her daughter when danger loomed? When I think about this, I feel glad that my severe morning sickness exposed Kevin's true character early on. Maybe it was my daughter who made me aware of this. From now on, I plan to appreciate the kindness of those around me and move forward with my daughter, looking ahead. Living off an $1,800 a month mortgage hasn't been a favor to you. I won't miss you if you leave. Lila, my son Marshall's wife, hurled these words at me, trying to kick me out of the house. Marshall chimed in too. Mom, you don't like us either, right? If you don't like it, then leave. My husband standing next to them wore a snide grin. Seeing them, my anger hit its boiling point. I don't want to be around these people anymore. Fine, I'm leaving. I packed a few essentials and left the house for real. Be prepared. I muttered to myself. My name is Jessica. I'm a 60-year-old working woman. I married Easton when I was 25, and a year later, our eldest son Marshall was born. Marshall has been a handful since he was young. My husband would always say, Boys will be boys. A little mischief is good for them and spoil him with endless toys. Because of this, Marshall was emotionally immature compared to his peers. I had many concerns about his future, but he managed to graduate college and enter the workforce. Ten years ago, he married Lila, a fellow worker. I was moved by how well he had turned out at his wedding, but little did I know this was the beginning of a nightmare. Actually, when talk of Marshall marrying Lila came up, a house was bought under my name. It was Marshall's idea. I want to live with you and Dad. You're both getting older, and life might get tough. Let's live together before that happens. It's better to have someone around who can help. Lila agrees, too. Touched by Marshall's thoughtfulness, I said, Thank you. If that's the case, let's live together. My husband seemed pleased, too. But the issue was, where would we all live? At the time, my husband and I were living in a condo, and Marshall was on his own in an apartment. Lila also had a small apartment. It was cramped everywhere for the four of us to live. Then Marshall came up with an idea. So why don't we just buy a house? Mom, you can take care of the mortgage every month. Wait, so we're all living there, but I'm the only one paying? Don't worry, Lila and I will cover other living expenses. You just need to handle the mortgage, Mom. I agreed to Marshall's request. The monthly mortgage was $1,800, and I've been paying it for 10 years without issues. Living in the house was comfortable, and everyone got along. We all had jobs, and our family savings were adding up nicely. But a year ago, I discovered $3,000 missing from our savings. I was looking at the statement and was shocked because I hadn't heard anything about it beforehand. When I asked the family, it turns out Lila was the reason. Actually, I used it to buy a designer bag. I've always wanted. I apologize for not discussing it beforehand. Lila seemed genuinely sorry, so I just said, All right, just let me know next time you're making a big purchase. But Lila's spending spree didn't stop there. She kept buying luxury items, depleting our savings. 
even when I warned her. Lila's bad spending habits only got worse, and so did her attitude. I have stress too, you know. What's the harm in a little shopping? She would retort, and refuse to stop her wasteful spending. For some reason, Marshall and my husband sided with Lila. Marshall was particularly harsh. Lila's having a tough time at work. Cut her some slack. My husband joined in, criticizing me. We're family. Understand her. No need to make a fuss just because the savings dropped a little. However, Lila was spending tens of thousands a month on luxury items. I warned them that at this rate, we'll run out of savings. I tried to bring it up, but the other three just kept saying, We can just save up again. What's worse, my husband and Marshall started joining Lila in her reckless spending. When Marshall brought home a wristwatch that cost more than $10,000, I seriously felt dizzy. What's gotten into you all? We're going bankrupt. My pleas fell on deaf ears. Then Marshall dropped a bombshell. I actually enjoy seeing you struggle, Mom. I've always disliked you. I thought living off your money would be enough. But now I want to see you suffer more. Buying luxury items with your money killed two birds with one stone. I was speechless. Seeing my reaction, Marshall laughed out loud. <laughs> What's with that face? This is all your fault, Mom. Then my husband chimed in. I thought Marshall was getting the short end of the stick, too. You know, never getting the stuff he wanted, living a life full of sacrifices. So I was on board with the plan to make you buy a house. My husband may be lenient with Marshall, but to go along with such a reckless plan? Just to be clear, I've never been unreasonably strict with Marshall. I've only emphasized basics like greeting people properly and meeting deadlines. I even bought toys for birthdays and Christmas. I thought he would understand once he became an adult. I never imagined he'd resent me for it. I broke down in tears, but the three of them just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> Crying doesn't make you any cuter, you know. I never liked you either, so I'm having a great time. Oh, let's all go to a fancy restaurant to cheer up. Without Jessica, of course. Lila said that, and Marshall and my husband agreed without a second thought. They actually left me and went out. I was so devastated that I broke down in loud sobs. <laughs> Revenge from the family I had always trusted was not something I could easily accept. After that, I tried to talk it out with my family. I wondered if we could reconsider and start over. But all my efforts were in vain. They just mocked me without listening. Our family savings are now almost depleted. I've reached my limit. Reviving this family is impossible. Lately, they've been saying if I'm unhappy, I should leave. Why is this happening to me? I'm not sad anymore. Mostly, just angry. One day after work, I found my belongings packed at the entrance. What is this? As I reacted in surprise, Lila smirked. Since you won't leave, I packed your stuff. We never asked for your help. Even if it was just an $1,800 monthly loan, we won't miss you. Marshall joined in. You hate us too, don't you, Mom? If you don't like it, then leave. My husband just stood there with a sarcastic smile. Finally, my rage hit its peak. I don't want to be with these people anymore. Fine. I'm leaving. With that, I took only the bare necessities and actually left the house. Get ready, I muttered to myself. I explained the situation to a friend over the phone and stayed with them until I found a new place. But I wasn't going to let them get the last laugh. I planned and executed my revenge. Sometime after I left, I got a call from Marshall. Mom. Something bad happened. Some guys came to the house and said it's been put up for sale and we need to leave. <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. B 
because I'm the one who put it up for sale. You can't just do that. Marshall was angry, but I thought the one being unreasonable was him. I bought that house in my name and paid all the loans, so I can sell it if I want. I even prepaid the entire loan, so don't worry about that. You should vacate soon. I hung up after saying that. I had been kicked out of the house abruptly, so those three have no right to complain, if they've lost their home, too. I felt a little relieved, but my revenge was far from over. The next day, I called my husband. Hello, can we talk? Where are you right now? Don't ask where I am. We're in the middle of an unexpected move. It's hectic. I'll call you later. My husband angrily hung up the phone. It was funny to see him flustered, but I hadn't conveyed my message. I sent a message saying we had important things to discuss and asked him to spare an hour. I got a reply two weeks later saying the move was done and to come to the new place. Well, finding a place and moving takes time. I arrived at the specified address and found a rundown wooden apartment. Compared to our old house, it was pitiful. My husband appeared when I rang the doorbell at apartment 103. He looked exceptionally grim. Upon entering, Marshall and Lila were also sitting there with grim expressions. Oh, what's with those faces? But what a lovely home you have here. Ignoring my sarcasm, my husband weakly said, Never mind that. What did you want to talk about? I pulled out the divorce papers. I want to sever ties with you. We're getting divorced. Upon hearing this, my husband's face turned pale instantly. Wait a minute. We can't afford a divorce. We have no money. What will happen if you leave too? I don't care what happens to you. I'm not your ATM. Three adults should be able to earn a living. The three of them exchanged troubled looks. My husband began to explain. Actually, Marshall and Lila were fired from their jobs. What? When were they fired? It was information I hadn't expected. Lila, three months ago, and Marshall, about a month ago. They had bad attitudes and were troublemakers, and we had no savings, so losing their incomes hurt us badly. Plus, we only found out they were fired when we chose a new place. They kept it a secret and pretended to go to work. Marshall chimed in, showing no remorse. When they say bad attitude, it's just stuff like ignoring deadlines and not greeting people. Since they were kids, I've always told them to meet deadlines and at least have the courtesy to greet people properly, and yet... Lila was no different. I only slept during meetings and threw coffee at my noisy boss, and yet they suddenly fired me? How unfair. That's when I decided to cut ties. Marshall and Lila, what you did could easily get you sued. I'm cutting ties with people who can't understand this even in their 30s, now agree to the divorce. I won't be giving you any assets. But my husband was still resistant to divorce. Marshall and Lila kept annoyingly begging for money. Frustrated, I pulled out a stack of papers from my bag. This is a copy of my diary, I said. It's all documented. The terrible things you've all said and done. I've been keeping track ever since you all got out of line. If you're not willing to go through with the divorce... I'll take this diary to my lawyer. Is that what you want? The word lawyer seemed to spook my husband, who quickly changed his tone. All right, all right, spare me the lawyer talk. I don't want to make a big deal out of this. Let's divorce. Marshall and Lila started to make a fuss. My husband yelled, Don't act all high and mighty when you're unemployed. They fell silent. Tired of the low-level bickering, I had them fill out the divorce papers. As I left the room, I told my husband, This mess? You're partly to blame for taking Marshall's side. Enjoy taking care of him. Being a parent to a grown child can be quite a challenge. I couldn't help but smirk. I had my own savings, so I didn't worry about making ends meet. I walked out of the apartment, light on my feet. Six months later, I got a call from my ex-husband. Jessica, can you help me out? Where are you? I've been asking around, but no one seems to know. I calmly said, Well, I moved, 
but I didn't tell you my new address. I've asked my acquaintances not to share it, so you three just live happily together. After the divorce, I moved out of my friend's place and found a new home. I explained the situation in detail to my company and was fortunate to be transferred to another branch that was short-staffed. I took proactive steps to ensure my old family wouldn't show up uninvited. Thanks to the cooperation of my friends and company, I was really saved. Despite asking for a lot, everyone handled it without showing any annoyance. Hearing people say, You've been through a lot, Jessica. It's not your fault. Lifted my spirits considerably. Just as I was thinking how blessed I was to have such supportive people around me, my ex-husband's loud commotion brought me back to reality. Please don't be so cold. Marshall and Lila don't work, and they're draining my salary. I even have debts. I'm on the brink of bankruptcy. I felt intense anger once again. He hurts people for his own selfish reasons, yet seeks help when he's in trouble. I couldn't help but shout at my incredibly selfish ex-husband. You've got some nerve. After tormenting me? You expect me to help you out when you're in trouble? Don't ever call me again. I hung up immediately and blocked his number. I also blocked calls from Marshall and Lila while I was at it. I had kept their numbers just in case I'd need to get in touch. But no more. I decided they were no longer necessary. I felt a sense of relief, like I finally cut all ties. All that's left is to hope for a peaceful life from now on. Later, I heard that my ex-family met quite a grim fate. My ex-husband grew sick of Marshall and Lila's wasteful habits and went missing soon after our last call. I heard he even quit his job and disappeared. I don't know where he went, but I doubt he's leading a happy life. Marshall and Lila, on the other hand, are still caught in their cycle of debt, their habits of squandering money unchanged. Even their family, friends, and relatives have abandoned them, knowing the mess they're in. I can only assume they'll keep sinking deeper into debt. When a friend told me all this, I felt a sense of achievement. I hope they regret their actions and continue to suffer. My ex-husband had been missing for a while, but I happened to see him living on the streets during a business trip. I never thought he'd become homeless. He didn't recognize me. He looked skinny and completely beaten down. Given his age, maybe he couldn't find another job. Marshall and Lila, meanwhile, filed for bankruptcy. They never stopped spending, borrowed money like it was nothing, so it ended up this way. There was no concept of living off hard-earned money for them. These two spent their days blaming each other for their financial ruin, fighting all the time. The outcome? They became a nuisance and got kicked out of their apartment. Another friend filled me in on this. But like my ex-husband, their whereabouts are now unknown. They might be homeless too, but I couldn't care less. No matter how miserable their lives become, I'll never lend a hand. In contrast, I've regained my peace. I was worried they'd hire a detective to find me, but thankfully they never showed up. They probably don't even have the money for that. All that reckless spending on luxury items, it's the epitome of what goes up must come down. As for me, work is going well, and I'm not struggling in life. Recently, a new member has joined my family. It's a pet goldfish. I was tagging along with a friend who has pets to a pet store when I fell head over heels for this adorable little creature. Honestly, I've never been particularly interested in fish before so I find it surprising that I even own one now. But this goldfish is just too cute, and watching it eat its food is particularly soothing. The best part? It doesn't require constant care, so even with my busy job, I can easily take care of it. It's added a new layer of joy to my life. I hope my days continue to be this peaceful moving forward. You don't even know that? Typical high school dropout. <laughs> How have you been surviving all this time? <laughs> Susanna, my sister-in-law, always made fun of my educational background. She seemed to think that education was the most important thing in life, ignoring the fact that 
There are many other important aspects. My name is Rosalind and I am a 28-year-old CEO of an IT company. I met my husband, Clifton, through work and we eventually got married. We currently rent a condo and live together. We both have incomes, so whoever can do the housework does it. However, I rarely have days off and usually get home late, so Clifton ends up doing most of the housework. Despite his own busy schedule, he never complains and takes care of everything. He never gets mad at me for focusing on my job and always encourages me, saying, I'm rooting for you. I felt blessed to be married to someone like Clifton. Life with Clifton was comfortable and peaceful. The only issue was Susanna, my sister-in-law. When I first met her after getting engaged to Clifton, I greeted her. Nice to meet you, Susanna. I'm Rosalind. Looking forward to getting to know you. Her immediate response was, What's your highest level of education? I was taken aback. Was that really the first thing they ask? I was annoyed but didn't want to make a scene at our first meeting, so I answered honestly. I dropped out. Upon hearing this, Susanna burst into laughter. A drop out? <laughs> Why would my brother marry someone so dumb? You should definitely reconsider. She said this right in front of me. Susanna, what are you saying? Education has nothing to do with marriage. Clifton quickly retorted. We are an elite family, you know. It's unacceptable for the eldest son's wife to be dumb. Maybe you should rethink this, bro, huh? <laughs> it was true. Clifton's parents were well-educated and wealthy. And both he and Susanna had graduated from prestigious universities. Susanna, cut it out. Rosalind built her own company from scratch. Are you still going to talk about education? People who drop out are the ones who think they can start companies. <laughs> hey, watch your mouth. Your company will probably go under soon anyway. <laughs> enough is enough. Clifton was getting really angry on my behalf. I was so furious, but I didn't want to cause a sibling fight, so I stopped Clifton. It's okay, Clifton, I can handle it. I had faced similar criticisms when starting my company, so I was somewhat used to it. In fact, it fueled my determination to prove them wrong. I could tolerate Susanna's snide remarks once or twice, but it didn't stop there. Sister-in-law, I'm here to visit! <laughs> Susanna often came over to our house to mock me for being a dropout, make snide comments and even brag about herself. You're here again, Susanna? Is it a problem? No, not really. But Susanna looked around our home and said, Do you even do housework, sister-in-law? <laughs> I do. We are dual income, so Clifton takes care of it often. My poor brother, having a wife like you must be tough. What do you mean? You're dumb but still working, and because of that, you can't even do housework properly, right? <laughs> if you're a dropout, you should just be a stay-at-home wife. At this point, I was getting really angry at Susanna's words. So, how is your company doing, sister-in-law? <laughs> I wondered why I had to share such information with her, but I answered anyway. It's going pretty well, I think. Really? <laughs> you must be running at a loss. That's not the case. I thought you'd go under sooner, but you are hanging in there. Thanks. And it's surprising that employees are willing to work under a dropout CEO. I would never. <laughs> I couldn't take it anymore, so I decided to change the subject. Aren't you planning to get a job, Susanna? She had graduated last year, but still hadn't found a job. I don't need to worry. Unlike you, I graduated from a prestigious university. <laughs> I'm taking my time to find a good company. Oh, I see. All my friends are working at big companies. My university is really something. 
And there she went, bragging about herself again. A lot of people from my university get jobs at big companies, and many became CEOs. <laughs> Susanna kept making snide remarks and bragging every time she visited. It was more bearable when Clifton was around to defend me, but it was really tough when I was alone. I didn't know what she might say to my in-laws. So, all I could do was endure it. As much as I could turn frustration into motivation, I was getting tired of Susanna's relentless jabs. Then, one day, she suddenly announced she was getting married. Oh, you're getting married, congratulations! Thank you, my fiancé is a Harvard graduate and very accomplished. Oh, I see. I couldn't help but think she chose her partner based solely on education. What does he do for a living? He is in IT and he works for a pretty good company. I see. It's not a big corporation, but it's a rapidly growing company that's quite famous around here. Ah, okay. And they have a very competent female CEO. Nothing like you, the dropout CEO. <laughs> None of your business. Do your best to keep your company from going under. <laughs> she was even more obnoxious than usual, perhaps because she was excited about her upcoming marriage. Oh, and please don't come to the wedding. <laughs> Why not? If his family finds out there's a dropout among us, the engagement might be called off. You wouldn't want that on your conscience, would you? I was dumbfounded by her ridiculous statement. Why would your engagement be called off just because I'm a dropout? That's absurd. I don't know. I just want to eliminate any risk factors, so please don't come. <laughs> Fine. On the day of the wedding, I was actually considering not going since Susanna told me not to. But Clifton was angry, saying, She's family. It would be weird not to go. What is she thinking? So, I decided to attend Susanna's wedding. However, when I arrived at the venue, she rushed over to me, saying, Why are you here, sister-in-law? You weren't invited. Please leave immediately. Susanna ran up to me and tried to kick me out. We don't even have a seat for you. It would be inconvenient if you stayed. Enough, Susanna. Stop it. As Clifton was about to get angry, the groom's parents came from behind and said, Oh, you're here, CEO! They bowed their heads to me. We're always grateful for how you take care of our son. Both of them bowed to me. No, no, the pleasure is mine. Congratulations on this occasion. Susanna looked stunned at the exchange between me and the groom's parents. Wait, what's going on? Do you know each other? I had no choice but to explain. Your husband, Victor, works for me. What do you mean? Whether she didn't want to believe it or was just too shocked to understand, Susanna seemed clueless. So, I'm the CEO of the company where Victor works. The competent female CEO you were talking about? That's me. What? No way! Finally, grasping the situation, Susanna was visibly flustered. That's a lie, there's no way! It's not a lie. Victor told me about the engagement recently. It's a small world. I don't believe you. Susanna didn't want to accept this fact and stubbornly refused to believe it. Just then, Victor arrived. What's going on? He seemed to have rushed over, sensing some sort of commotion. Nothing, it's fine. I decided to brush it off, not wanting to make a scene. Anyway, thank you for coming, boss. Victor bowed deeply to me. Of course, I'm happy to attend your wedding, Victor. That's it. Hearing Victor call me boss, Susanna finally seemed to believe it. She was at a loss for words. Your seat is prepared over there, boss. Thank you. It turned out Victor had prepared a seat for me, even though Susanna hadn't. I wasn't invited by you, but I was by Victor. For the rest of the wedding, Susanna's face 
with stands. She even tripped while walking down the aisle, making for an awkward scene. Victor was also upset with her, saying, What's gotten into you today? I couldn't help but laugh at Susanna's sudden change in attitude. I'm sorry for the terrible things I've said before, but I've always thought you were amazing, sister-in-law. I could only respond with a wry smile. Is that so? <laughs> you are a CEO while balancing work and home life. That's incredible. Ah, oh, thank you. You've built a successful company despite being a dropout. I was slightly irritated, expecting her to bring up education again. Being a dropout has nothing to do with it. When I responded a bit strongly, Susanna immediately apologized. Oh, sorry, you're right, it doesn't matter. Maybe she was worried about upsetting me and jeopardizing her husband's job. She started trying to win me over. There are many things more important than education. Exactly, you can always study. Being a dropout doesn't mean you can't be a CEO. You're so right, I admire you. Ah, sure. <laughs> It felt strange to hear such words from Susanna. I had to laugh a few times, but it was better than being belittled or hearing snide remarks. After that, Susanna was planning to start her own business instead of getting a job. She was flattering me on the surface, but she must have been frustrated deep down. Since my sister-in-law, a dropout, could do it, there is no reason I can't. Susanna probably thought that way. But she gave up on her business venture within a few months. So, you tried starting a business? How'd it go? I deliberately asked Susanna after hearing from Clifton that she had given up. Not so well. <laughs> oh, really? I realized once again how amazing you are. Good to hear. Susanna was smiling and talking cheerfully, but her expression was tense. She must have been quite frustrated. She then tried to find a regular job, but had no luck. Then she said she wanted to join my company. You want to work at my company? Yes, please. She probably thought she'd get hired easily through connections. I've always wanted to work here. She even told such an obvious lie. Weren't you the one who said you didn't want to work under a dropout CEO? When I said that, she tried to dodge. Did I say that? Must have been my imagination. I wasn't going to forget that. At that point, I didn't want to work with her, but I decided to ask her some more questions. So, what qualifications do you have, Susanna? Qualifications? We are an IT company, so having IT-related qualifications would help, but it's fine if you don't. Um, not really. Did you not get any qualifications in college? I have some, but the qualifications she got in college were trivial and easily obtainable by anyone. So, what can you contribute to the company? Um, nothing, really. I could see why she was having a hard time finding a job despite graduating from a prestigious university. What did you study in college? Or did you just play around for four years? I was an excellent student. Being good at school doesn't mean you are good at work. Companies don't need people like that. I was just giving my opinion as a CEO, but Susanna got angry. Don't belittle me. I have a degree. I have confidence that I'm better than most people. That's called baseless confidence. <laughs> we hire based on ability, not education. Sorry, you're not a fit. What? So we can't hire you. That's ridiculous! Why wouldn't you hire me? She was furious, probably because she was rejected by a dropout like me. It's fair, you've been rejected by every company you applied to, right? Well, that's… Victor is doing well, and we are paying him a decent salary. You could live on his income alone. Why not be a housewife? I can't believe this. Just give up on finding a job. After that, Susanna gave up on employment and became a housewife, just like I suggested. But she couldn't cook or even do laundry. 
She had always relied on others and never did anything herself. It seems like Susanna couldn't even become a housewife. Even Victor was getting frustrated with her. Now she's learning housework while getting scolded by Victor's mom every day. Who knows when she'll become a competent housewife? Her friends made snide comments. You graduated from college but couldn't find a job and had to become a housewife? How embarrassing! It must have been a huge blow to her pride. She became quite depressed and lost her energy. On the other hand, everything's going well for me. The company is growing, we are hiring more stuff, and my workload had decreased. I've even managed to catch up on housework and cooking. The only stressor, Susanna, has quieted down, so I'm living fulfilling days.